Meg Rossoff was born in Boston and arrived in London in 1977, aged 21, just as punk rock was kicking off. And I am so jealous of that. Mm. <laughs> and yes, just like the pulp song, she studied sculpture at St. Martin's College. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she is also a graduate of Harvard University. She lived for a period in New York, then returned to London in 1988, working in advertising, and continues to live in London. At age 45, Penguin Books published her first novel, How I Live Now. It would be fair to say that How I Live Now hit the international publishing scene rather like punk rock hit the music scene in the 1970s. It's a powerful, passionate, enduring book, and it made her name. Its title, um, which is somehow both forthright and angular, is a clue to what's inside, a, a classic story that doesn't fit the standard expectations of fiction for young people. And I don't mind saying that when I reread it recently, uh, preparing for tonight, whew, I've put the book down with great racking sobs. Um, <laughs> just moved by the compassion that um, Meg brings to uh, these, these damaged and fearless uh, characters. And I knew how it ended, you know. <laughs> um, the book won some important awards, uh, the Guardian Prize for Children's Fiction, the Michael L. Prince Award for Young Adult Fiction in the United States, and the Branford Bowes Award, recognising the book's fine editing. And if we were to list all of Meg uh, Rossoff's work, uh, the awards that her work has won, we wouldn't have very much time to talk at all. So let's briefly note um, that other awards include back-to-back -back Carnegie medals for her novels Just In Case and What I Was, the German Youth Literature Prize for Just In Case, the Alex Award from the Young Adult Library Service Association of America for her novels uh, where her, in America where her novels are published as adult fiction for The Bride's Farewell. And The Bride's Farewell is also on the shortlist for the Carnegie Medal, the winner to be announced at the end of next month. But let's not... Um, you know, Dwell provoke <laughs> the, uh, the literary gods. Her stories are serious without being earnest. She's funny without being trivial. The writing is brilliantly polished and never flashy. Simply put, Meg Rossoff has raised our expectations what fiction can be. She arrived in Melbourne at 5am this morning from London. Would you please welcome Meg Rossoff? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Adrenaline. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. I live up to that now. Fine effort. Fine <laughs> effort. Um, uh, Meg, some people say that the uh, the start, the beginning, is a very good place to start. But I'm not a great um, Julie Andrews fan, and I'm not <laughs> sure if you are either. So I'd like to start with your next book, which is titled "There Is No Dog." There's something cryptic going on here. What? What's going on? It's funny. It's one of those titles that um, my mother, my mother drives me mad. She's 82 years old, and I'm 54, and we're still having those ridiculous petty arguments. So she phoned me up the other day. She said, I think this is your, I think this is possibly your best written book. She said, but what about that title? It means nothing, nothing, nothing at all. I finished it now. I keep looking for a clue, and there's no clue. <laughs> there is no clue. There is no clue. And, and uh, uh, she said, I really think you should change it. I said, Mom, I, I can't change it. It's too late. It's gone to proof. It's, it's, it's in the bag. I said, my publisher would be happy to change it too, I think. Um, and she said, well, it's never too late. It's never too late. Just change it now. <laughs> so anyway, it, I, I'm going to tell as many audiences as I can, and maybe I'll get to everybody, that it's based on a joke that I heard about 25 years ago, and obviously stuck in my mind, about a dyslexic atheist walking up and down in front of a church with a sign saying there is no dog. <laughs> right? 
And it's also, it, it's, I just have to say a couple of things about it because I have this v sort of strange relationship with the edges of reality, as some people may know if, if, if you've read my books. Um, and things started going a bit, there is no doggy, right at the beginning. Because when I, when I had just first started writing the book, and I'd also fairly recently started riding horses, and I was jumping a friend's horse over a triple jump, which I should, probably shouldn't have been doing at my age. And after the second jump, the horse suddenly spooked madly and, and leapt out, and I went flying. And um, just before I, I flew off, I saw out of the corner of my eye this big black and brown dog run out in front of us. And uh, when I kind of picked myself up, this was my first concussion, um, and I picked myself up off the ground, and I said to my friend, where's the dog? What, how, where, where did that damn dog come from? Where is it? And she said, the immortal word, she said, there is no dog. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, I'm hallucinating. Um, and uh, I said, oh, very strange. I, I've written a book with that title, and also I'm starting to hallucinate dogs. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. The borders are quite fuzzy. Yeah, borders are getting fuzzier, which is a worry. So it's, it's a story of uh, a boy who's about 15. I know. See, I had him at 19, actually. His girlfriend's 21. I think we better make 19, him a little right. bit older. Right, he's 19. Yeah. Oh, you can dream. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he's 19. He falls in love with a woman called Lucy. Yeah. Um, he who, is God, by the way. He is God. Yeah, he is God. And uh, she's a, a Rubenesque young woman. Yeah. Who, um, who falls for, for God as well. Yeah, she does. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one. I, uh, I guess you're always looking for the perfect boyfriend, really. But he's, he's wildly, wildly imperfect, actually, as a boyfriend. But his, of course, what he has, I mean, he's, he's as hopeless as a human being can possibly be, basically. And if you think of anybody who has a 19-year-old son or ever had a 19-year-old son uh, or was ever a 19-year-old boy will know that 19-year-olds are not the people you want as God. Um, <laughs> And he is all those terrible cliches. He's sex mad and lazy and completely self-obsessed. Um, and he gets America and Africa mixed up because he's a little bit dyslexic and he doesn't really care. Um, and he does all the creation in six days um, because, not because it's a great miracle, but because he's too lazy to think it through properly. Right, but what he does have is this extraordinary intensity, and 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 I really was kind of trying to write a little bit about teenage, you know, as well as writing about you know doing a, my my take on Hitchhiker's Guide to the whatever the universe, um, and I thought that is what that is what nineteen year olds have. They're hopeless. They drive you mad. You want to smother them really pretty much every day, but that intensity, the passion, the um, you know, the fire is something you do slightly lose as a as a grown up to a large extent, and so I suppose that's what she falls in love with. Yeah, yes. Um, could we have a a little taste of the book? Could you read yeah. the, uh, the opening? I read my favourite bit. Ooh, ah, ooh. Uh, it's a very, very small taste because. And this mm. book will be out in August in uh, the UK and. August here or September here? August here. I am reliably informed. Um, I have never read, read from this book. Um, so this will be... Well, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs. Is that enough? Oh, yeah. yeah, really, really short. Okay. This is not chapter one. I usually read chapter one. This is chapter six, but I think you'll, you'll get where we are pretty quickly. Uh, in the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Only it wasn't very good light. Bob created fireworks, sparklers, and neon tubes that circled the globe like weird tangled rainbows. He dabbled with bugs that blinked and abstract creatures whose heads lit up and cast long overlapping shadows. There were mile-high candles and mountains of fairy lights. For an hour or so, Earth was lit by enormous crystal chandeliers. Bob thought his creations were very cool. They were very cool, but they didn't work. 
Mm. Is that enough? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of um, dysfunction uh, at play in the world. And a lot of it is kind of triggered off by Bob's emotional state, it seems to me. You know, you know it was one of those ideas. It, it started with uh, my husband listening to Radio 4 one day. My husband's a painter, and he happened to be at home that day working. And um, he came down and he said, oh, he said, Radio 4 drives me mad. It's so conservative. They were doing a program on uh, people who've played God in the movies. And he said, it's all middle, it's all uh, white old white men. He said occasionally you get Forrest Whitaker or somebody, who, or no, it's not Forrest Whitaker, it's anyway. Morgan Freeman. Morgan yeah. Freeman, uh, um, as an old black man. He said, why doesn't anyone ever have a teenager as God? And it was one of those great moments where you think, boing. And, and actually, I talked about the book for a very long time, and I... It, it clicked into something immediately, that idea. Um, and, uh, you know, I... Uh, when, when I was a kid, and I've always been an atheist, I think I was born an atheist, even though I was born into a, you know, moderately god fear no, not really, I mean, Jewish family, we don't, Jews don't really believe too much in God, but, um, but I do remember when I was really, really young, six or seven years old, and, and standing at a, at a bus stop, and, you know, it was the, it was the 60s, and, and people were preaching all the time what a wonderful world we lived in, and how perfect it was, and how God had created this wonderful place, um, um, and, and I remember thinking this, you know, we are so flawed that we have to wait for buses. You know, if we were really proper godlike creatures, we would just blink our eyes and we'd be home. And I mean, I was really young then. And, I, you know, it's those, what you realize as a writer is that these things that you worried about and thought about when you were six or seven just keep going into your life and eventually end up in your work. So that idea that, you know, why, if you're going to have a perfect world, if God's going to create this beautiful world, what, what have we got tornado? and tsunamis and, you know, all that kind of stuff for. And so that, sorry, this is a very long answer to your question. But um, so, so, yeah, I mean, the idea that there's a 19-year-old loony who's having a hormone rush and um, leaves the bath running and therefore floods the world it seemed just about right. It, it is. I, I kind of think of the book as a, a sort of metaphysical burlesque. You know, it's, it's yeah, a kind I like of that. Can I, can I use that? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and I, I sort of thought, oh, you know, have you called it there is no dog to avoid having a brick thrown through your window? Well, you know, somebody asked me today whether it was originally there is no God um, and that Penguin asked me to change it. But actually, I think Penguin would have much preferred if it had been called there is no God because um, the managing editor at... Um, my managing editor in London um, also finished the book and said, I I'm sorry, I really just don't understand the title. And, and I said, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always, sort of, I always drag out um, Catcher in the Rye. Anybody in the audience know what Catcher in the Rye means? There's some, some reference to the Bible somewhere, yes, you know. Well, anyway, somebody knows, but <laughs> not me. Mm -hmm. um, there's also in the book, um, Bob is, is, is God. He is the supreme being. Yeah. But he has a, he kind of has a, exactly a boss. Mr. B. He's got an assistant, really. An assistant. Who's older. My sort of age. Yeah. Didn't get the job. Yes. Went for the gig, but didn't get it. Yeah. Yes, well, um, for my sins, I worked in advertising for 15 years, and there's a little bit of this book that is slightly an advertising novel, because as you get older and older in advertising, and you get wiser and wiser and more and more cynical, you find that your bosses turn out to be younger and younger, until they're, you know, practically 12, 13, 14-year-olds. And it's always the same line. They always say, oh, no, no, he, yes, we've given him 400 million pounds worth of global accounts to run as the creator director. Uh, no, he, he's got no experience, but we think he's got a lot of creative energy. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that in my career. And it always meant the guy is, you know, thick as two short planks and doesn't have a clue. And so this is, you know, I obviously I got fired a lot from, from advertising jobs. Um, and so this is slightly my kind of take on that. The, you know, the person who genuinely cares about the world. Um, is the second in command and basically in charge of 
dusting up and trying to trying to keep things, you know, trying to add a little bit of compassion Cleaning to the job. Cleaning up the mess. Cleaning up the mess, yeah. Yeah. The considerable mess. Yeah. Um, so was working in advertising anything like Mad Men? I can't, um, I, I can't watch Mad Men because even though everybody dresses better in the 50s yeah. and early 60s, it's basically the same. It, it hadn't changed at all when I was in it. Um, it may, I don't know, a bit more glamorous than possibly. Yeah. It's just the stupidest career ever in the history of the world. <laughs> and, I, and I regret horribly having done it, but I learned a lot as well from doing it. Well, um, you know, apart from the knowledge that you didn't want to work in it, yeah. what did advertising teach you as a writer? Uh, amazingly, I mean, it took, I think it was one of the best apprenticeships that a person can have. And the whole concept of apprenticeship is, is an interesting one. I get a lot of manuscripts sent to me by 17-year-olds who said, I have sworn to myself that I will be published by the time I'm 18. And my line is always, look, you really don't want to peak at 18, because if you live to be... 95 or 110, that's a lot of years of disappointment ahead. <laughs> um, so, so that whole kind of, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks in Outliers about 10,000 hours in order to perfect anything. And I had 10,000 hours of writing and writing under pressure and writing rubbish. So, you know, you have to figure out a way to sell the worst product you can possibly imagine to someone who doesn't want it. And if that isn't good, you know, writing, uh, you know, you've got to, you, it's all lateral thinking. How do you distract them from the product so they don't care about it and, you know, they want to buy it just because you charm them or, you know, stuff like that. And, and, and of course, brevity, you know, you, you also, you're, you're talking to an audience who definitely doesn't want your product. I mean, that's the first rule of advertising. And it's probably quite a good rule of, of writing novels as well. I mean, nobody is sitting there waiting. Well, yeah, Andy Griffith said, you know, his job, you know, a, a kid's job is not to read his books. His, yeah, it's exactly. It's his job. To make them want to. Yes, exactly. And, and actually, anyone who's ever been to the Frankfurt Book Fair will know what an utterly terrifying... Have you been? No, but uh, I... I and it's the most terrifying experience in the world. It's like coming down in the largest airport you can possibly imagine full of books. And all you can think... I mean, it really, you sort of panic, and you think, oh, my God, all these people are competing against me. And there are millions and millions and millions of them. And then you try to get out, and you can't, because there's no exits, and it's just horrible. <laughs> The layers of <laughs> hell. Yeah, best not to know, really. Um, you, you, said, you said something about the length of your novels, that there seems to be a kind of natural length to your stories. Do you want to just touch on that? Yes. That, I was wondering about that recently, whether that's just pure desperation and laziness, which I think it, well, do you think so? it might not be? I, I, when I wrote my first novel, I had to email my agent and say, how long should a book be? And she said, well, if you're writing for young adults, somewhere around 70,000 words. Um, and I've never made it anywhere near 70,000 words. I mean, my, uh, in fact, There Is No Dog is the first one that's slightly peaked over 50,000. And a part of it is desperation. Part of it is because I, I'm so bad at, at plot, plotting a book that, um, I, you know, I try desperately to get a, an arc written, and that's usually about 25,000 words. And then I usually give it to my editor. And because um, editors are so badly paid, uh, probably all over the world, but certainly in the UK, um, they all get pregnant about halfway through each book I, <laughs> I write. And so um, I've had five different editors for five different books. So each time I send a first draft, you can see the panic. I mean, they look like deer in the headlights, you know, because they think this isn't a book. But, but to me, I, I know I can fill all the rest in once I get the plot down. And, and so that original kind of outline is, t to me, says, yes, I can do it. Um, but often it's very painful that, to just get that 25,000 words down or, or thereabouts. Um, I'm trying to answer your question here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm going to get back to it because my mind is drifting back to whatever I was doing on the plane this morning. Um, yeah, 50,000 words. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, usually by the time I get to 45,000 words, I've pretty much said everything I could possibly need to say. And then I go through and I add a bit more, and there's almost always a character missing. 
that gets added quite near the end, um, or something fairly dramatic that happens somewhere near the end, and then I get, go through and knock out another 5,000 words. That was probably more information than you needed, but yeah, I, I, I would like to write a big, juicy 80,000 word novel, but I just don't seem to be capable of it. Uh, well, look, I would just say that many is the time I've read a novel that I felt could have could have done with could have had twenty thousand less words in it. Well, you know, I edit a third of every virtually everything I read, and anybody who sends me a manuscript for for criticism, almost always I say just take a third of it out. And when I I used to read lots and lots of novels to my daughter, and I and my, the rule was I. I won't read you anything you could read yourself. So I was reading her stuff like um, Gerald Durrell, My Family and Other Animals, and stuff like that when she was about nine years old. And as I was reading, I would have to say, oh, God, get rid of a third of that sentence. And literally just editing it as I went. Um, Anna Green Gables, if you've ever read it aloud, has just far too much rubbish in it. So, yeah, probably a third too long, everything. Yeah, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you know, you're a writer I can get with, a taker-outer. Yeah, you know, yeah. They're, they're put her in, isn't it? It's like, oh, enough, yeah. too much. Yeah, too many, too many words, says, who was it? Uh, who said that to Mozart? Too many notes. Too many notes. Yeah, too many notes. <laughs> Can we talk about The Bride's Farewell, which is your most recent published book? Um, came out here, did it come out here last year? I think I read it last year. Year before, maybe. It was certainly yeah. my... My favourite book of last year, my overseas book of last year. No, um, no question. That's so and nice and to it has that lovely <laughs> story arc that you, you you talked about. It's a very kind of clean, clean sort of shape. That well, first of all, um, I'm really glad you liked it. I rather love that book, um, but it's it, it just hasn't sold very well. Um, and I, I'd, I'd kind of quite like to know why, because it got really, really nice reviews, and everybody who's read it really likes it. But yeah, I think there's something about the words historical novel that make people run away, but it's not really a historical novel. Well, yeah, novel. I mean, let's, let's talk about that. I mean, um, it's, it's not a novel in which you're going to learn about crop rotation or the five major glove-making towns of England yeah. or, you know, uh, how tomato growing transformed local festivities. Although I did read about all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, right. But when you read it's the book... It's basically a journey, really, you, isn't you it? You feel that you've lived in that world. The, the yeah. texture of the book is extraordinary. It's very, very strong. So well, how, how do you research a novel like The Bride's Farewell? Uh, well, I did uh, major in English literature in my extremely kind of peculiar career at Harvard. Um, in fact, I remember doing my first Victorian novel course, and I had the, I had the books piled up like this the night before the exam, and I realized Over I had... 50,000 yeah, words. No, exactly. Novels, yeah. Huge, huge books, 800 pages. Mm -hmm. I hadn't read any of them. Um, but, you know, that's when being a really good writer comes in handy. Um, <laughs> You sort of write a generic kind of essay. So I'd, re you know, eventually I got around to reading all of, you know, you know, a lot of 19th century literature, and also I looked at a lot of uh, paintings because there was a real nostalgia. The, uh, Bryce Farewell is set in about 1850, and you know, there are funny things that just hit, and I imagine it happens to most writers, but just hit in your brain. And I heard a statistic that said in 1800, something like 90% of the population of England lived in the countryside and, and lived in agricultural life. By 1900, it had completely reversed and 90% lived in the cities. And what that did in my head was to bring two images to mind. One was a kind of migration. I mean, 100 years is not that long. I had this vision of all these people physically moving and, and of a lot of empty buildings. And there must have been a lot of empty buildings. And so then, you know, once you start thinking of that, and then, of course, all those um, Victorian women who were who were slightly freakish. I mean, you think of Victorian women as being quite repressed and, you know, being tied mm. into their clothes mm. and wearing corsets and all that. But then there were the ones who dressed as men and rode camels across the empty quarter and, you know, seemed to think that was perfectly normal. So there was all that kind of stuff. And then... Um, 
looking at the paintings, there, there was a nostalgia, there was this great movement of, of painters in around 1880 who were looking back at the 1840s and 50s and painting these little really sort of sickly sweet chocolate box paintings of tumble-down cottages with roses growing up the front. But if you look at the paintings really closely, you could see the subtext, which was the little tiny windows, you know, and the kind of, you know, all right, the children were drawn, there were maybe eight of them, and they all had rosy cheeks, but, you know, it was probably consumption. Um, and, you know, the, and, and, you know, the chimney would always look slightly as if it was falling off and it was too narrow, and so there was all that kind of stuff. And then there was one other thing, which... Um, uh, after I wrote Just In Case, which features an invisible greyhound, um, I fell in love with a greyhound and did what you're not supposed to do, and I went out and bought two um, lurchers, um, who then slightly ruined my life. But anyway, I've got these two dogs. And so I got really interested in lurchers, which for anyone who doesn't know what a lurcher is, it's a, it, it's a, it's a very English sort of hunting dog. Because, uh, gonna They're go. the shaggy head sort They're of shaggy, thing. They, yeah, they, big, they, long, lean body. Long, lean body. They're half greyhound or half whippet and then half... Uh, terrier usually or some kind of working dog and there was this this guy whose whole body of work I discovered he died in 1984 but he lived as a 19th century poacher he was a school teacher but he his books were absolutely brilliant and he wrote all about poaching techniques and you know he lived this kind of renegade life and I thought uh, you know I've read all of these books I know all about poaching so I may as well have my hero be a combination of Mellors from Lady Chatterley's Lover and um, The Poacher. Yeah. You've got to get, you get your kick somehow. <laughs> and that's the dog man. But that's the dog the, man, the, yeah. the story is chiefly about a girl called Pell. Yeah. You could read us maybe the opening of the book? Yes, yes. Pell. And introduce Pell. Yes. You know, somebody, I, I, I was doing a talk at a school and somebody put, someone put their hand up and said, excuse me, miss, um, could you tell us what Pell is short for? And I thought, I have no idea, <laughs> actually. It never occurred to me that there was a real name. Anyway, if anyone has any suggestions. Well, Stephanie wasn't Penelope. On the morning she was to be married, Pell Ridley crept up from her bed in the dark, kissed her sisters goodbye, fetched Jack in from the wind and rain on the heath and told him they were leaving. Not that he was likely to offer any objections, being a horse. There wasn't much to take, bread and cheese and a bottle of ale, a clean apron, a rope for Jack and a book belonging to Mam with pictures of birds drawn in soft pencil, which no one ever looked at but her. The dress in which she was to be married she left untouched, spread over a dusty chair. She felt carefully inside the best teapot for the coins put away for her dowry, slipped the rope round Jack's neck and turned to go. Head down, squinting into the rain, she stopped short at the sight of a ghostly figure in the path. It had as little substance as a moth, but its eyes burned a hole in the dark. Go back to bed, Bean. It didn't budge. She sighed, noticing how the pale oval of her face remained stubbornly set. Please, Bean, go home. Oh, God, she thought, no. But it was no use appealing to God about something already decided. Without waiting to be invited, the boy scrambled up onto Jack, and with no other option, she pulled herself up behind him, feeling the warmth of his thin body against her own. And so it was, with a resigned chirrup to Jack, and no tear in her eye, that they set off down the hill, heading north, which at that moment appeared to be the exact direction in which lay the rest of the world. I'm sorry, Bertie, whispered the girl, with a final thought for the husband that should have been. Perhaps at the last minute he would find another bride. Perhaps he would marry Lou. Anyone will do, she thought, as long as it isn't me. Hmm. One of the things that I love about this novel is the language. It's plain, simple, unfussy. It, it's, quite, it, it's quite naked kind of language. It, it, it's not drawing attention to itself. How, you know, how yeah, do you feel about that? And, and it fits the landscape so well. 
It's a, that's a really interesting question because when you, when you set to write set in a different time, you don't, you don't want to write pastiche, you, and especially when you're American, you know, and living in English, you can't start going, ooh, ar, me love, you know, I, I just nip down to, you know, I mean, I, you know, exactly. It just sounds just like that. Uh, so I had to, I had to I, you know, there's no dialect in my blood, really. But what I did do was I really looked at some 19th century novels quite carefully just to sort of figure out what was it that made them slightly different. And there are things that make them different. I mean, the, the, no one ever, you, very little use of the pronoun I, for one thing. Um, and it's interesting to try to write without ever using I, particularly, you know, when you're writing so close to the first person, it wasn't really quite first person. but. Um, um, you know, just sort of funny, I'm trying to think what else there was, but it was a, sort of a question of getting, getting a rhythm. Something about the syntax of it. And, and something about the syntax and, and something about keeping it uh, almost Quaker in, in feeling, you know, very bare. She wasn't a wildly educated person. Um, and I wanted just to kind of capture that simplicity, really. I don't know, that doesn't explain it. Yeah. But it, it it works really well, and and it's also it's, it's not no say it's not kind of it's not showy it's not you know it's not yeah showy I, I I try not to use adjectives or adverbs really whenever possible and also you know I sometimes I I don't really almost never go back and and read my books again because I'm terrified that I'll realize how awful they really are. But the, I, and I do tend to read the same passages over, over and over again when I read them out loud. I tend to read the beginning. But just reading it then, I got a little jolt to pleasure. I thought, it's very nice, the whole bit about leaving the dress she's supposed to be married in. Because, you know, on a dusty chair, ooh, dusty, you know, dusty. <laughs> mm. um, but, you know, it, it's what I like to do with writing is to, is to, is to just gently insert the information in the description, so you know she, before you even know that she's running away, that she was supposed to be married, and that there's a wedding dress being abandoned. You don't quite know why yet, but it's all coming. Economy. Economy, it's got it. It's a great book. Um, tell me about Ray Hewitt. Ray Hewitt. Oh, Ray Hewitt. Ray Hewitt, oh, it's funny talking about economy, because I just do talk on and on and on, but... Um, <laughs> I guess I try to get it out here so it doesn't sneak into my writing. I got involved about six months ago uh, with a storytelling group in London. I don't know if they're popping up around Australia, but they're, they're just emerging all over um, England. And we meet once a month in a pub. There are four of us who organize it, and I call myself the um, resident pimp because I spend my life going around saying to people, will you come to this pub night and, and tell a story? Um, and they have to tell a 10-minute story, and it has to be true. And, and we get five stories in an evening. And it's an amazing, amazing evening. But early on, because the three of them were involved for a long time, and then they brought me in at sort of six or eight months later. And... Um, Early on in my job as resident pimp, um, I got a, a bit panicky, and I thought, oh, God, I'm not going to have enough people to uh, come next week. In the meantime, I'd written a blog uh, entitled My Friend Kills People, because a very old friend of mine married a, a helicopter pilot in the British Army, and they'd come to stay for the weekend, and it was just slightly freaky to suddenly realize that this guy who I love is on his way back to Afghanistan to drop bombs on people. And um, I got a funny comment on the blog that said, uh, keep low, stay safe, or stay low, keep safe, or something. Um, and weirdly, I watched Hurt Locker on the, um, on the plane, and uh, stay safe is the thing that they kept saying. And it, anyway, I went, I, it, I went back to the blog of the guy who left me the comment, <clears throat> and it turned out that it was this incredibly dark, passionately written, uh, blog about uh, the first Gulf War, and it, he was a soldier. And I read it for a few days, and, and I thought, Jesus Christ, and it was flowing out of him. He was posting two, three times a day. 
and it was so well written. And so I sent him an email on the spur of the moment, and it was quite a scary blog, very violent and all about, you know, flashbacks he was having. Um, There's a lot of post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress. I didn't quite realize then that he was writing on the advice of his psychiatrist. So I... (laughs) I sent him an email saying, do you live in London and can you tell a story? Um, And he emailed back and said, yeah, soldiers were famously good at telling stories. And I then went to bed and I didn't sleep all night because I thought, oh, God, Meg, what have you done now? You know, it's the sort of thing your mother always told you not to do and you're making friends with... Strangers on the internet. Yeah, strangers, psychopaths on the internet and he's going to come with an AK-47, he's going to kill us all. (laughs) So I got up the courage. He'd sent me his phone number. I got up the courage. It took a huge amount of courage to phone him the next day, and he actually sounded so sweet, as murderers so often do. (laughs) Anyway, he came along um, a month later, and he was the nicest man ever. And then the following month, he told a story, which was just brilliant. And um, to make a very, very long story, a little bit shorter, I got my agent to look at his blog, um, and I put him in touch with a publisher in Scotland who was very interested. My agent passed him along to someone else, passed him along to someone else. And in the end, really quite quickly, he ended up with... um, Andy McNabb's agent. Andy McNabb, everybody, you know, billion-selling military, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, he's now written 60,000 words of his book, and the agent, who is a very tough and rather cynical, because he emailed me and said, yeah, thanks for sending this guy along, but actually, you know, his stuff is depressing, and, you know, I don't like the title, and blah, blah, blah. It was quite a snippy email he sent me. Um, and so I said, to, I phoned Ray up, and I said, Ray, he thinks you're too depressing. Can you write funnier? And he goes, yeah, I can write funnier. So he started writing funnier. And he can. He's incredibly funny as well. And um, so he hasn't got his book contract yet, but he's going to have one. And, and I, you know, I just keep sending him emails saying, um, make sure you don't spend it all on drugs. And we've become actually kind of really close. And, uh, you know, the, I, I wrote a blog, um, which Mike obviously saw, which I was talking about the power of storytelling. And I was thinking about the fact that I've completely changed this guy's life. 20 years he spent, you know, in and out of jail, I think, and in and out of psychiatrist's office. And he's lost his wife. He's lost his kid. And he is one of the best writers I think I've, I've ever seen. And certainly the best natural writer I've ever seen. And he's changed my life because, A, I feel, you know, that kind of altruistic glow you feel when you kind of change somebody's life and you kind of think, oh, I'm really awfully special, aren't I? Um, and, uh, and he's going to have to be grateful to me for the rest of his life. Um, but then there's the other thing, which is that that whole, he started me thinking about the whole transformative power of storytelling. You know, that he was, when I met him, he was a failed soldier. He was a guy who'd gone to war, sixth generation soldier, and it had so freaked him out that for the next 20 years it had destroyed him. And by turning it around and making him realize that actually he was a writer who'd gone to to war much too young. And that's what I said to him. I said, Ray, that's what you are. You're actually a writer. You're not a, you're not a soldier. And he said, now I'm starting to think of myself as a writer. And it's just extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And I started thinking also about how people in prison or how kids or, you know, anybody, the story you tell about yourself defines who you are. And it is possible sometimes to change the story and change who you are. Yeah. Well, um, it's a remarkable story that at 45, you debuted with a novel called How I Live Now. It's 47, actually. 47? Yeah. <laughs> That's really old. <laughs> um, and it set a new standard. Um, and I think it scared the hell out of a few people. Um, you know, it, it is that classic thing, the old Franz Kafka, you know, ice pick to the uh, frozen sea. And, um, yeah. you know, what happened? You woke up one morning... Yeah, I think I kind of didn't know any better in a funny way. Um, so I think I wrote... Uh, I, d- I think I'd, I... I was trying to write a children's book, you know, and, and I used, well, a teen book, mainly because my agent was a teen agent, so I thought that's what I had to do. 
Um, and she, it has all the elements, or a lot of elements of classic children's fiction. It does, and 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 that's where I started, because because I'm not, I'm really, and I'm not being modest. I'm not good at plot. It's plot is not what I notice ever. I'm interested in characters, and I'm interested in you know what what happens in their heads, but not plot. So I just stole, you know, the most obvious plot I could, which is you know the kid who goes and stays in another family. You know, which I mean has been used in five billion children's books, and um, there's an email somewhere that I sent to a friend in New York saying, I, "I've just started writing the great English novel. Uh, it's been two days. It's really boring. I think I'll throw in World War Three." Um, <laughs> and you know, I mean, that, it, it, it is kind of the, the glib way of looking at it. But you know, England was talking, and America, where everyone was talking about invading Iraq at the time. And so, you know, it's what's it's zeitgeist. And, and zeitgeist may be something that I picked up a bit from advertising. A, a, a bit like There Is No Dog. I think there's a lot of zeitgeist in that book. Yeah, full of zeitgeist. When, when I first read How I Live Now, I was reminded of something um, the singer or songwriter David Byrne said years ago. And it's just a phrase that stuck in my head. He was being interviewed for New Musical Express um, about a song called Life During Wartime. <laughs> Do you know that was the working title of the book? <laughs> Up until the very last minute. Thank you. All right. You are really good. You are... <laughs> well, then you probably know what David Byrne said uh, when he was asked in New Musical Express about the song. <laughs> what did he say? He said it would be a joke to write some cheap moralistic crap about how war is bad. And that summed up the book for me. It summed up how I felt about how I live now, because it's not really a book about war, is it? Uh, no, it's sort of about things that happen to other people that don't seem terribly serious, uh, in a way, I think. I, I wanted, to, you know, the, I, I invented something when I was writing it called the over there syndrome. And, and I had heard, I heard myself telling a story to someone saying, did you hear about that ferry that, that sank off the coast of India? Uh, and they said, oh, no, was that in the news? I said, yeah, yeah, something like 70 or 780 people died. And as you say those words, 70 or 780 people, you think, well, it doesn't really matter because they're, they live far away and they speak another language and they don't care about their families as much as we do. And, you know, hearing, you know, part of being a writer is that, is that awful bringing yourself up and saying, I can't believe I, was, I thought that. And so in a way, it's that over there syndrome that I wanted to to stop, to, to, to make, I wanted, to, I wanted people to think about it, you know, mm. this is, and also, I mean, you know, being American, everything happens over there, or at least it did in the olden days, you know, now mm. some mm. of it happens there. Some of it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Daisy, Elizabeth, as she begins the novel, Daisy, as she quickly becomes, um, she comes on like Holden Caulfield with an eating disorder. Mm. <laughs> um, she said some incredibly funny things. She said, uh, I don't get nearly enough credit in life for the things I manage not to say. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's totally me, I'm afraid. <laughs> so is Daisy a character, a, a voice that you carried around in your, in your head, or was it only when you sat down to write the novel that you saw her? No, everybody's asked that. I literally... Well, I try. No, I had... I... Uh, I had never dared to think about writing a novel, although I sort of secretly wanted to, but I didn't think I could ever be good enough. And I was one of those overachieving, you know, Harvard students who uh, I was comparing myself to the people I thought were the best writers alive. And I didn't want to write a novel unless I could write one as better or as good, at least. Um, so I never really thought about it until I went to lunch with my agent that day. And the reason I had an agent was because when I finally did dare to write a novel, I wrote a horse story because I'd read every horse book ever written and I knew I could steal a horse plot. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that's when I realized that you could steal plots and make them your own. And, and so on the way to lunch, I thought of the girl who goes to live with her cousins in the country. 
um, and I started writing it in the third person. And I also emailed a friend of mine, the only person I knew who was a writer, who was the wife of a friend of my husband's. And I quickly wrote this panicked email, how do you write a novel? I mean, a proper novel. And she wrote back and said, well, you know, you, you write down all your list of characters and you kind of write down the plot and you kind of outline each chapter roughly. And I tried to do that and I couldn't. I completely failed. Um, and so I just started to write. And it was about the second or third day that Daisy's, I realized I had to switch to first person. Mm -hmm. And Daisy's mm -hmm. voice just boing, just popped into my head and there she was. And, and it was strange. It was like taking dictation, hearing that voice. I mean, she's forceful. Yeah, and she's, I mean, you know, writing in the first person, I try not to do it too often because for some bizarre reason I think it's cheating. <laughs> you know, like really serious writers write in the third person because it's harder. Um, <laughs> But, you know, writing in the first person, they're, I mean, I've written, I think, two books in the first person, and, and they're both, I mean, all my characters are kind of me anyway, in, in extreme versions. There's a bit of, quite a bit of Daisy in, in me. Um, yeah. I was I lucky. Mean, uh, yeah. Um, and about Daisy and, and Edmund, um, you know, their relationship gets a lot of press and a lot... Of, you know, if you ever mention to anyone how I live now, they will talk about the relationship between Daisy and, and Edmund. To me, it's the most important relationship is the one between Daisy and Piper. Yeah, That's the transformative relationship in that book. Yeah. Um, yes, you're absolutely right about that. That's why you're not a 15-year-old. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's, uh, it, you know, and I think it's something, because I lived in Manhattan for, for 10 years, and, you know, the, the things I hate about America, um, in the way that only an American can, can hate things about America, is that self-indulgent, that endless whining, the fact that people go, you know, I have friends who... Uh, I mean, everybody went to a shrink w when I lived in New York, and I went for three years and it saved my life, and it was brilliant, and I'm, you know, much wiser and all that kind of stuff for it. But my two best friends, who also started going to a shrink about the same time I did, are now uh, 30, uh, 30 20, 24 years later, still going twice a week. You know, and it does this really freakish thing to you to go in, pay all that money, and talk about yourself all the time and sort of get permission for all this stuff. And so I thought, you know, really, the problem with, with so many of these characters is that they're thinking of themselves all the time. And I thought, there's no eating disorders in Kosovo. You know, you can't afford to have an eating disorder when you're starving to death. And so I thought, okay, well, then that's it. You know, how, and that's, and in a way, it's a metaphor for the whole teenage condition is you're too inward and it's painful to think about yourself all the time. And really what you want in life is to be responsible for another person because then you don't have the luxury because they then become more important than, than you are. And once somebody else is more important, somebody else's life is more important, then you have a kind of, weirdly, it's a very freeing, at least I think it is, it, it's a very freeing kind of um, relationship that happens. And, and it does save her. I think, more than Edmund saves her. Falling in love is, is one very important thing in her life, but being responsible for another human being is more important. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great, such a tender relationship. My last question is um, that the film version of How I Live Now is in pre-production at the moment. Uh, nervous? My daughter says to me all the time, because she's obsessed with stars, and, um, and she's just also a boy she has a crush on who has auditioned for the role of Edmund. And virtually every day of my life, she says to me, Mommy, can you call them up today and tell them to, um, to cast Luke? And I say, yeah, but, but Gloria, I, I've never met Luke. And she goes, no, 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 no he's, he's good, he's really good. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, that's not anything to do with nerves. But her big question to me is always, why aren't you more excited? And the reason I'm more not more excited uh, is a wonderful story that, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, a writer called Deborah Mogak, who wrote a book called Tulip Fever, which was about the um, 16th century? Uh, the, the, tulip late, uh, the, the, the tulip trade in Holland. The tulip trade and the huge bubble in Holland. 
And um, I heard her speak about it once, and she, they were all on set in full costume with uh, 20,000 tulip bulbs ready to shoot when Gordon Brown changed the tax laws and they pulled the whole production. That's why I don't get too excited, because I'm Jewish, and I figure if anything bad's going to happen, it's going to happen. So, you know, I, I, listen, when I'm walking down the aisle and they say, and the Academy Award for the Best Picture goes to, then I'll get excited. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, all I can say is good luck with it. Yeah, I hope, I hope they do it justice. Yeah, I hope so, too. I hope so they too. can do it justice. I hope so, too. They're, they're going to try. They're, they're a good group of people, and... And he's the director is a guy called Kevin McDonald who did um, Last King of Scotland and Touching the Void and I mean he's made some very good films and there's a good screenwriter and so you just keep your fingers crossed mm. and if it's really good I'll take credit and if it's really lousy I'll say it had nothing to do with me <laughs> the bastards they ruined my book <laughs> what can win, you win. do? <laughs>